Hashish in Marseille by Walter Benjamin. After long hesitation, I took hashish at 7 o'clock in the evening. I am taking down notes of what possibly follows only to determine whether it will take effect. As my solitariness hardly allows for any other supervision. Next to me, a small child is crying, who disturbs me. I think that three of an quarters hour have already elapsed. And yet, it has actually been only half an hour. Thus, apart from a very absent mindedness, nothing's happening. I lay upon the bed, read, and smoked. Now, the images begin to take hold of me. The street that I had so often seen is like an incision cut by a knife. All the while, opposite me, this glimpse of the peintre of Marseille. Now the images begin to take hold of me. The street that I so often seen is like an incision cut by a knife. I definitely feel the effects now. Essentially negative in that reading and writing are difficult for me. A good three quarters of an hour has transpired. No, it seems that much won't come. Postscript during dictation. Things happen in the following way. I finally left the hotel. For it seemed to me that no effects were apparent or else they were so weak as to overrule the precaution of staying in my room. First, the station. The cafe of the corner. Now what? Only the sure benevolence. The anticipation of seeing people amiably disposed towards one. The feeling of loneliness quickly vanishes. My walking stick becomes especially delightful to me. The handle of a coffee pot suddenly looks very large and remains so. One becomes so sensitive, afraid of being hurt by a shadow falling across paper. Disgust disappears. One reads the slate on the pisoir. I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. So and So came up to me. That he doesn't do so does not matter to me either. But it's too loud for me there. Now the demands which the hashish eater makes on time and space come into play. They are, as is well known, absolutely real. Versailles is not too great for one who has eaten hashish nor eternity to long-lasting. And in the background of these immense dimensions of the inner adventure of absolute duration in the immeasurable spatial realm, a wonderful blessed humor now lingers all the more agreeably with the contingencies of the spatial temporal world. I am endlessly aware of this humor when I find out that the kitchen at Basel and the entire upstairs have just closed the very moment I sat down to talk in eternity. All the same, the feeling afterwards that all this indeed remains forever, constant, lit up, well patronized and full of life. Presently I must note how I happened to find a seat at Vasos, which one had from the upper story. As I was passing by below, I spy an occupied table on the balcony of the second floor. In the end, however, I only got as far as the first. Most of the tables by windows were occupied, so I walked over to quite a large one, which seemed to have just become free. The moment I sat down, though, the disproportion became apparent to me. Disgraceful to seat myself this way at such a large table. So I walked on through the whole floor towards the opposite end, to take a seat at a smaller table, which had just then become visible. But the meal was later. First, the little bar on the port. I was again on the verge of making a confused retreat, for I heard a concert. What's more, a brass section coming from that direction. In that little port bar, the hashish began to allow its truly canonical magic free reign with a primitive acuity, which I had hardly experienced before. Namely, it began to make me a physiognomist, at any rate an observer of physiognomies, and I witnessed something quite unique in my experience. I became dead set on the forms and the faces around me, 
which were partly of a remarkable rawness and ugliness. Faces which I generally would have avoided for two reasons. Neither would I have wished to draw their attention to myself, nor would I have been able to bear their brutality. It was a seemingly advanced outpost, this post tavern. At best, I now grasp all at once how to a painter has it not happened to Rembrandt and many others. Ugliness is the true reservoir of beauty, better than the receptacles of its treasure. Just as the jagged mountain chain could appear with all the interior gold of the beautiful sparkling from its folded strata, vistas, and ranges. I particularly recall an infinitely bestial and vulgar face on one of the men from which the wrinkles of abandon suddenly struck me. It was men's faces which appealed to me the most. And now, too, I began the long sustained game in which an acquaintance surfaced up in front of me in each new face. Often I knew his name, often again not. The deception vanished as deceptions in dreams vanish, that is, not in shame and with oneself compromised, but rather on trouble and friendly, like a being which has performed its obligation. Under these circumstances, there could be no talk of loneliness. Was I my own companionship? That certainly though, not quite so conspicuous, nor do I know if that would have particularly pleased me. This, on the contrary, was no doubt more likely. I became my own truest, most sensitive, most shameless pander and procured for myself with the ambiguous certainty of one who is intimately acquainted with and has studied the desires of his customer. Then it began to take half an eternity until the waiter appeared. <laughs> Rather, I couldn't wait for him to appear. I walked into the bar room and left the money on the table. Whether tips are customary in such tavern, I don't know. I would have left something in any case, though, otherwise. First, I ordered a dozen of oysters. The men also wanted to know right then what was to be ordered for the following course. I indicated a standard something or other. Then he returned with the news that they were out of that. So I looked over the menu at the other courses under the same section, seemed about to order one when the name of another above it caught my eye, until I had reached the top of the list. It was not out of gluttony though, but rather a quiet, pronounced politeness towards the hunters, which I didn't want to insult by disregarding them. In short, I got stuck on a pâté de lion. Pâté de lion, lion pâté, I thought, laughing facetiously as it sat before me nicely on a plate, and then disdainfully. This delicate rabbit or chicken meat, whatever it may be, to be sated on a lion would not have seemed at all out of proportion for my lion appetite. Besides, it was secretly all settled that I would go to another restaurant after I finished at Basus and have dinner a second time. First, however, was the way to Basus. I glided along the quayside and read one after another the names of the boats docked there. At the same time, I was overcome by an incomprehensible cheerfulness and I smiled in the face of all the first names of friends there in a row. It seemed to me that the love which was promised by these boats along with their names was wonderful, beautiful and touching. Only one call, Aerial Second, which reminded me of an air warfare, did I pass over unaffably, just as I had been forced to avert my glance from certain overly deformed faces in the bar which I just come from. Upstairs, the tricks comments for the first time when I looked down. The square in front of the port was, to put it best, like a palette on which I mixed the local colors at random, probing this way and that, irresponsibly if you will, but like a great painter who views his palette as an instrument. 
I was extremely reluctant to partake of the wine. It was half a bottle of dry wine. A piece of ice swam in the glass. It was, however, exquisitely compatible with my drug. I had chosen my table because of the open window through which I could glance down at the dark square. And when I did so from time to time, it had a tendency to alter itself with each person who set foot on it, as it formed a figure in relation to the person which, mind you, had nothing to do with how he saw it, but rather was closer to the view of the great portraitists of the 17th century, who cast persons of title in relief by positioning them in front of porticos and windows. Here, I must make this general remark. The solitariness of such a house has its shallow side. To speak of the physical aspect alone, there was a moment in the port tavern when a severe pressure in my diaphragm sought release in humming. Furthermore, there is no doubt that many a beautiful and illuminating thing remains dormant. But on the other hand, the solitariness acts in turn as a filter. What one writes down the next day is more than an enumeration of sequential events. In the night the rouse stands with prismatic edges against everyday experience. It forms a kind of figure and is more memorable than usual. I should say it contracts and in so doing fashions the form of a flower. To get closer to the riddle of bliss in rouse, one must consider Ariadne's dread. What delight there is in the mere act of unwinding a skein. And this delight is quite profoundly related to the delight of the Rausch, as it is to the delight in creative work. We go forward, but in doing so, not only do we discover the bends of the cavern in which we venture forth, but rather we savor this happiness of discovery by virtue or that other rhythmical bliss which comes from unraveling a sky. Such certainty from the intricately wound sky that we unravel. Is that not the happiness of at least every prose form of productivity? And under hashish, we are prose beings savoring at the peak of our powers. De la poesie, le doy a monsieur. Lyrical poetry, not for a penny. At a public square, an all-engrossing sensation of happiness came over me, which is harder to get a grasp of than everything prior to this point. Fortunately, in my newspaper, I find the sentence. By the spoonful, one must draw sameness out of reality. Numerous weeks prior to this, I would read a sentence by Johannes Jensen, which seemed to say something similar. Richard was a young man who had a sense for everything in the world of the same kind. This sentence had quite pleased me. It now enabled me to confront the political rational sense that it had for me with yesterday's experience of a individual magical one. Whereas Jensen's sentence meant for me that things are, as we certainly know, so thoroughly mechanized and rationalized that whatever today is particular lies hidden in the nuances only. In the sight yesterday was completely different. I saw nuances alone, and they were the same. I became inwardly engrossed in the pavement in front of me by means of a kind of salt, magic salt, that I glossed it over with, so to speak, this very same pavement could have been Parisian pavement. One often talks about stones for bread. Here the stones were the bread of my imagination, which thereupon had suddenly become voracious. During this phase, as I sat in the dark, the chair against the wall of a house. There were fairly isolated moments of an obsessive character. Certainly, who else shared my rouge here on this evening? How few! As though I were not capable of sensing the danger of approaching misfortune and loneliness, the hashish was ever to remain. In this thoroughly intermittent stage at nearby nightclub's music, which was following me, played an extraordinary role. It was peculiar 
how my ear made a point of not recognizing Valencia as Valencia. Gluck drove past me in a taxi. It was a fleeting moment. And when I discovered such literary figure again at a nearby table, I said to myself that I had finally found out what literature was good for. But there were not only familiar figures. Here in the stage of the deepest reverie, two figures, Philistines, vagrants, who knows, passed by me as Dante and Petra. All men are brothers. Thus began a train of thought which I can no longer follow. But its final segment was certainly much less banal than its first and led perhaps into animal imagery. But that was at a stage other than the one at the port from which I find the short note, acquaintances only and beauties only, namely the passerbys. The music, which meanwhile continued to blare and subside, I've forgotten the reasons with which I permitted myself to tap my foot to the beat. That goes against my upbringing, and it did not happen without inner conflict. There were times when the intensity of the acoustic impressions crowded all of the others. Most of all, it was the din of voices, and not the streets, which drowned out everything in the little port bar. The strangest thing about this noise of voices was that it sounded entirely like a dialogue. The phenomenon of alienation, which may be implied and which Krauss has formulated with the fine adage. The closer one looks at a word, the further away it looks back, appears to refer to things there too. At many rate, I find among my entries the astonished note. How things resist one's glances. The effects were off. It was not far from that other, the first cafe of this evening, when the lover's bliss, which the contemplation of some fringe ruffling in the wind imparted suddenly convinced me that the hashish had begun to take effect. And when I recall this state, I would like to think that hashish, in relation to nature, possesses the force and power of persuasion to allow us to recapture the greatest squandering of one's existence. For when we are in love and our existence slips like gold coins through nature's fingers, which cannot hold on them and must lavishly spend them in order to obtain the new being, the newborn, then, without hoping or expecting a thing, she flings us with both hands full toward existence.